In this section, we'll learn our last method of integration, the last new type of integral that we can handle using what we call trigonometric substitution or trig substitution. Let me illustrate with an example. And I'll show you two examples before illustrating the general process. For this type of substitution, it's similar in theory to U substitution, for instance, or integration by parts, or picking a substitution to make this work. But if you try doing this one by U substitution, for instance, you'll very quickly get frustrated because there's no U and DU parts that you can pick that will make the substitution turn into something that you can integrate easily. After we do a couple of examples, I'll show you how to recognize when to use trig substitution so that after we've seen all of these methods of integration, you can go back and when you encounter a new integral, you can think through all of the methods of integration you know how to handle and you can find which one works best. So for this substitution, I'm going to make a substitution without really explaining why. So I'll start by making a substitution and what we'll observe is just that it works. So without explaining y too much, let me just say, let x equal sine of theta. And after we've done this example, it'll become clearer why that's helpful. So at first, it's hard to see why this substitution will be useful, but after we see this example, we can observe why that helps. Now notice carefully that this substitution is unlike the other substitutions we've done. In the past, we have defined a new variable like u in the way that we've picked u equals something in terms of x or dv equals something in terms of x. This time, look at how we've defined it. We've said let x equal sine of theta. So we've still picked a new variable theta that we're introducing, but the way we've defined it is a little bit backwards. In other words, we could define theta equals the sine inverse of x, but the way we've defined it is by saying let x equal sine of theta. So we're still defining a new variable, theta in this case, but we do so by defining x equals sine of theta instead of saying theta equals sine inverse of x, for instance, even though that's true, we define it in this way, let x equal sine of theta. And the reason we do that, as we'll see, is that once we replace x with sine of theta, we can take advantage of a trig identity that emerges. So let's think this through carefully. If x equals sine of theta, then as we go to make substitutions, first of all, we'll need to figure out what dx is and then we'll see what happens with this complicated square root. So first of all, if x equals sine of theta, then dx, just like before, is the derivative of that, or cosine of theta, d theta. And then this square root turns into the square root of one minus sine of theta squared, or sine squared theta. And notice what happens. When we have one minus sine squared of theta, we have a trig identity, the Pythagorean identity, that says we can replace one minus sine squared with cosine squared. And of course, when we have the square root of cosine squared, we can simply write that as the cosine of theta. Which means our integral gets much simpler because now, one over the square root of one minus x squared becomes one over cosine of theta, and dx becomes cosine of theta, d theta, which means the cosines cancel, and we just have the integral of d theta, which is simply theta plus c. Now, just like with any substitution method, once we've integrated in terms of our new variable, theta in this case, we want to rewrite the answer in terms of x. So we'll go back here where we note that theta equals the sine inverse of x. And so sure enough, our answer is sine inverse of x plus c. And if you look back at your Calc 1 notes, you should find somewhere written in there 
that the derivative of the sine inverse function is one over the square root of one minus x squared. So if you happen to memorize that and remember it, you could have looked at this one and known immediately what the answer was. But we can also use trig substitution to do this. So let me run through quickly again what we just did. We defined a new variable, but we did it a little bit backwards where we took the variable we're already working with and said let x equal sine of theta. So there's this implicit definition that theta equals sine inverse of x, but the way we write it is letting x equal sine of theta. And then we looked at our integral and said that means we need to replace dx and the square root of one minus x squared. So let's find what both of those pieces are if x can be replaced with sine of theta. And if we do that, we found both of those pieces here. And then we took our simplified integral. And the reason it simplified is because of the Pythagorean identity that when applied to one minus sine squared replaces it with something simpler where we can take the square root and just get cosine of theta. So the entire reason this works is because of that Pythagorean identity. It's built around that. And so by choosing x to be sine, the identity worked in our favor to simplify things. Now it turns out with this problem, we could have also picked x equals cosine of theta, or in other words, theta equals inverse cosine of x. And you could work it out in much the same way, and it would work that way. But just by convention, we tend to pick sine for this type of problem because we don't have to then work with a negative in our dx and so on. So it makes things a little bit simpler to choose sine of x instead of cosine of x, but otherwise there's no reason you couldn't do cosine of x. Now let me show you a similar problem that's a little bit different, but having seen this one, we should be able to work out what to do in this new problem. So let's say we want now the integral of the square root of four minus x squared. Notice the similarity. We still have the square root of something minus x squared. Earlier we had one minus x squared, here we have four minus x squared. And that is already starting to look like a pattern. And in a minute we'll write down the pattern that you can look for to indicate that trig sub is the way to go when you're integrating. So we're going to let x equal, like we did before, something with the sine of theta. But you should pause here and see if you can figure out what's missing. In other words, if you try to do this one the way we did the last one, it's not going to quite work out the same way. There's something we need to add to make this work. And see if you can pause the video and figure out what we need to include. If you're thinking about this Pythagorean identity, when we plug in sine of theta for x, for instance, we're going to get sine squared here. But the Pythagorean identity says if we have one minus sine squared, we can work with that, not four minus sine squared. So the four needs to be factored out. And if we had something like four minus four sine squared, we could factor out a four and have a one minus sine squared that could be replaced with cosine squared. And you'll see that worked out as we go forward. So since we need a four sine squared in order to factor out the four, we should let x equal two sine of theta. In other words, we're looking at this four here and saying when we square x, we need to have a four also. So we'll use the square root of that. If it were nine minus x squared, we'd let x equal three sine of theta. If it were five minus x squared, we'd let x equal the square root of five times sine of theta and so on. Other than that, the process works just like the one we just did. So then dx equals two cosine of theta, d theta. And then we can simplify the square root of four minus x squared by replacing x squared with two sine of theta. So we get four minus four sine squared of theta. We can then factor out the four and replace one minus sine squared with cosine squared, simply using the Pythagorean identity. Now when we take the square root, we get two cosine of theta. 
And I like to do this form of simplification where I tackle one part at a time. I figure out dx by itself and figure out the square root part by itself so that when we go to simplify and substitute things in, it substitutes large blocks at once so that now I'm not doing my simplification all in the same integral. I'm doing it off to the side like this. That's entirely a choice, but that's how I choose to keep things organized. And it turns out to be helpful in a lot of complicated problems. So now we can substitute these pieces. The square root of four minus x squared gets replaced with two cosine of theta. The dx gets replaced with two cosine of theta d theta, which turns into four cosine squared of theta d theta. And at this point, the integral looks kind of complicated, but if you think back to what we did in the last unit with trigonometric integrals, we did exactly this sort of thing. We integrated powers of sine and cosine. So there's a reason that we're doing things in the order that we are. Many trig substitution problems, after you make your substitution, turn into a u substitution problem with trig integrals, either with powers of sine and cosine or with powers of secant and tangent. So this is one of those cases where we need to go back and rewrite this using the half angle identity, it turns out, so that we can integrate. So if you remember the half angle identity, we can rewrite this as the integral of four times one half plus four times one half times the cosine of two theta. Or in other words, the integral of two plus two cosine of two theta, d theta. And when you integrate, you get two theta plus the sine of two theta plus c. So now we need to substitute back in terms of x. So we'll replace all the thetas with the equivalent in terms of x. Now it turns out at this point that there's an extra trig identity that we need because we don't know what to do with this sine of two theta. So there's an extra trig identity that you may have seen a long time ago, but it probably has been a while. And I don't expect you to remember this necessarily. If you need this identity, I will give it to you on a test, for instance, or you can look back in the notes here. But it turns out that the sine of two theta equals two times the sine of theta cosine theta. So again, that'll be given to you if you need it. You may need that in some of the homework questions, for instance. So the reason we're replacing that is because we know something about sine of theta and cosine of theta and their relationship to x. What we don't know is sine of two theta. There's no relationship that we know offhand between sine of two theta and x. So we need to figure out how to replace theta, sine of theta, and cosine of theta with something in terms of x. Now it turns out everything we need is somewhere written up above. And so all we have to do is look carefully at what we already know to find our replacements. For theta, we'll just look at where we have x equals two times sine of theta, and we can rewrite this as theta equals the inverse sine of x over two. Let me write that down here below. If x equals two sine theta, then we know that x over two equals sine of theta, or theta equals sine inverse of x over two. Now what else do we know? Where else do we find sine of theta? Well, this part's easy. We know that x equals two sine of theta, so we can just replace that with x. Or if we didn't have a two here to work with, we could rewrite sine of theta equals x over two and just replace this part with x over two. But it turns out conveniently we can group the two with it and just replace the two sine of theta all at once with x. Now the cosine of theta is a little bit trickier, but if you look back carefully, and again I mentioned 
the way that I arrange these problems is by defining x and then finding dx and finding what that square root simplifies to. Because when we do, notice that this square root simplified to two cosine of theta. So there's our cosine. We know that the square root of four minus x squared equals two cosine of theta, which means if we divide this by two, that's equal to the cosine of theta, which means we can make our substitutions. Two times theta equals two times the sine inverse of x over two. Then two sine theta can be replaced with x and cosine theta can be replaced with the square root of four minus x squared over two. So the answer is complicated looking at the end and it certainly is complicated especially because there are so many moving pieces here and there's several stages to the problem. So let's go back and review quickly what we did just to see the overall approach and make sure that you can follow from the start to the finish. These problems can be a little bit long, but the overall structure of the problems we'll do after this one looks very much like this one. So if you can do this one, you can get the sort of the general approach to these problems. So we defined x in terms of theta. In this case, using the sine function was helpful because of the structure and the way that it kind of mirrored one minus sine squared equals cosine squared. That's important and we'll point that out with other examples later on when we use something other than sine of theta. But once we picked x equals sine of theta, then we can find dx and we can simplify that square root that's kind of the main feature of the problem, the square root of four minus x squared. And all of these trig sub problems are gonna have a similar looking square root. And again, we'll point out the kinds of problems that we'll encounter in just a minute, but they're all gonna have this similar kind of setup. And once you start simplifying, it's gonna simplify quite nicely using the Pythagorean identity to, in this case, two cosine of theta. Once we do that, we make our substitution, and this one, unlike the first example, the integral was not so easy once we substituted. We actually had to go off and do a separate integration problem using what we learned in the last unit on integrals with powers of sine and cosine. In this case, it was cosine squared, and we needed to use the half angle identity. There was this added complication of this sine of two theta, which could derail us, but all we needed was that extra identity that you probably don't remember from your earlier classes, but it's there to help us when we need it. And then at the very end, replacing theta with equivalent pieces in terms of x is also trickier than the first example we did. Now we had to do a little bit of work and go back and find how can we replace theta? How can we replace sine of theta? How can we replace cosine of theta? But each of those pieces was something we had worked with earlier, we just had to find a way to replace them. And once we did, we got our answer. So the general appro approach is once you pick x equals some function of theta, then you simplify everything and substitute. That'll turn into a trig integral that you need to do, possibly using u substitution even. And then once you do that, there's a little bit of work to figure out how to replace it in terms of x. But if you can follow this problem again, the other ones will be very similar. So in the next video, we'll talk about the general structure of a trig substitution problem and what to look for in the various forms that you'll run across.